All right, so what we've got here is a Lagrangian form d phi squared minus v of phi. And um, we're thinking here in terms of one plus one dimensions. In the, this, of course, is a demented way of writing two. One plus one. But it means one space and one time dimension. And um, in particular, if one has a kink, if one writes this as lambda over 4, p squared minus v squared squared. Actually, a more convenient choice of normalization is a 2 here. But um, my notes are kind of 4. The um, mass or energy of the configuration, let's look at a time independent configuration and figure out what its energy is. Then it would be an integral over the single space dimension of a half phi prime squared plus again lambda over 4 phi squared minus phi squared squared. And so if you want this thing to be finite energy, Notice that we've incorporated symmetry breaking here. And um, the sense in which we've incorporated this is if m is to be finite, then v, then phi throughout most of space has to be essentially v plus or minus v. And um, so what you can have is you can have what's called a kink solution. So here I'm plotting phi as the vertical axis and space as the uh, horizontal axis. And, so, and um, minus v here and let us say plus v there. So you can have a solution of field configuration phi of finite energy if it's minus v most of the time and then it goes up quickly to be v and stays v out to plus infinity. Or it could flip down again and stay minus v and then flip up, stay v and so forth. These configurations are, 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 are called uh, kink and anti-kink configurations. This is a kink That's an anti-kink, and you could have a finite energy configuration with an arbitrary number of kinks and anti-kinks. The, um, the mass of the, the kinetic energy here is um, the derivative, which is basically V over L, where L is the, the, the distance it takes, the distance in space that it takes to go from minus V to V. So it's that squared. The uh, potential energy is the width here, L again, and then the, top, the, the, the distance that it spends at zero, say. And so that's lambda v to the four. And if you minimize this, um, what you find out is that, um, well, L lambda v to the four. And uh, you minimize this by taking L to be something like one over v square root of lambda. Did, um, we can look at for the this theory not only has kinks in it but it also has um, so to speak elementary particles which are just the um, the small vibrations of phi in other words we let phi equal to key 
pl uh, plus V. In other words, it's V almost everywhere, and then it's key, it's key some, somewhere else. So did, did I do this for you? Did, were you here when I did this? No. no. OK. All right, in that case, what does the Lagrange density look like? L is now, since the because so, V is a constant, so the derivative is zero. So do you have a question? Plus V, I was What's V? Plus V. Yeah. What's V? Oh, uh, the other. This is a key. A key, yeah. Oh, That's key. Great. Well, in other words, this is the field. We're taking it, if we want to find out energy, another way of having a finite energy configuration, if it doesn't go all the way from V to minus V, is to say that it's always V, except for small departures called key. And if we look at what the Lagrange density for that theory is, just substituting, letting V equal key plus V, but was all those letters sound the same. Then what we get is minus lambda over 4, and now this is v plus p squared minus v squared squared, and so that is a half v p squared minus lambda over 4, and now the v, of v squared cancels, and so you get 2v chi plus chi squared squared, and so this is a half d chi squared minus lambda over 2 um, d squared chi squared, and then you get minus lambda v chi cubed, and then minus lambda over 4 chi to the fourth. So this is what the theory looks for, like for the field chi, or key. I don't even know which better pronunciation. In any event, uh, if v is small, if, if lambda is small, and if we, we, we're also going to think of key as small, or chi as small, then we can, at least in, in, in figuring out what this theory looks like, what the normal modes of the theory, we usually ignore the um, higher powers of the field. Imagine the field is small. And so then the math, this, this would be a theory d chi squared minus mu squared over 2, t squared, and so we see that the mass squared is equal to lambda v squared. In other words, the, 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 the mass of the um, fluctuations or the... Of, in other words, if we quantize this theory, it would be a theory of particles of mass mu, where mu is equal to v squared of lambda. Now, um, one other thing is we can, if we substitute for, we already minimized the mass of the kink and we found that L should be around 1 over V squared of lambda. This means that the mass is of the order of, and something like mu cubed over lambda root 2. And that's just an estimate um, obtained by setting L equal to, say, V squared of lambda and putting that in here. And that uh, in terms of V, it's um, the same thing as uh, square root of 2 mu uh, V squared. So there's a v squared from there, and then L is this should be V 
bigger. Oh, I'm sorry, there's some U there. It's uh, it's actually V cubed. Well, it's it is this, but it's also in simpler terms, in terms of V, it's two V cubed square root of lambda. So in other words, L is one over V. This is, this is giving me V squared. Getting now V the fourth lambda. Oh, I forgot to multiply by L. So it's the derivative squared times the distance. And this is, okay. in any event, these are the right numbers. I shouldn't try to do everything in my head. I look at the notes. Um, there's a cute inequality that you can uh, derive here. Namely, that the mass is an integral dx of the half p prime squared plus lambda over 4 cos. Um, in fact, let me do this more generally. So I'm here departing from the notes a little bit. You see, you can write this potential energy as a positive definite term. And in fact, it's a perfect square. And that's often the case in these theories of solitons. So we can write this as, let me write it as u squared. Then what you can say is that um, this thing, that if you had p prime plus or minus u squared, um, I've got a one half here. So the, the integral of this is obviously greater than or equal to zero. And if we expand it, what we get is dx. Um, actually, this is a one over root two. We get a half five prime squared plus u squared, and then we get plus or minus um, 2 over root 2 phi prime u. And this integral is greater than or equal to 0. And so that means that the mass, which is an integral dx of a half phi prime squared plus u squared, is then greater than or equal to um, root 2, integral root 2 phi prime u dx in absolute value because we've got either sign here. And um, so this is an integral that you can sort of do. It's square root of 2 integral of p prime u dx. And in many, this is u of phi. So you can write this as root 2 d by dx of the integral, the phi integral of u. So what would I call that? Big u dx. But that then is just square root of 2 big u at infinity minus big u at minus infinity in absolute value. So in other words, the mass of the kink is greater than or equal to this. And in the particular case at hand, little u is square root of lambda over 2 times v squared minus v squared. And so big U is square root of lambda over 2, phi cubed over 3, minus B squared phi. Okay. So B 
big U is the phi integral of little u. And um, so this tells you that uh, if you take it, if you consider a king configuration where at plus infinity it's v and at minus infinity minus v, then when you subtract the two, since these things are odd in phi, you just get twice what this is. So the answer is square root of lambda v cubed over 3 minus v cubed, but in absolute value. And so that's um, two-thirds root lambda v cubed. And um, so that's a rigorous lower bound on the mass of the kink. And um, in fact, I, if I'm not mistaken, that's exactly what the mass of the kink is. If you um, work out an exact solution. In fact, I'm going to get to the exact solution in a minute. It turns out that these, these um, Theories, of course, have nonlinear field equations. That is to say, the, the field equation for this theory is basically, this gives you a d by dt squared minus d by dx squared, essentially. And then that's equal to the phi derivative of this thing. That's the Grandes equation. And so it's a phi cubed, as well as a phi squared. It may even be a linear term. Anyway, so the result is you have a nonlinear uh, in in Lagrange's equations or a nonlinear partial differential equation. And um, in fact, um, this let's see. Suppose I write it this way. Suppose L is a half. I've got the wrong chalk. Hold on. Chalk it. It's more visible. And nuts. That one isn't visible either. Let's try this. Yeah, this is the visible one. All right, suppose, suppose this is our theory, and that's supposed to be a little, that's not big U, that's little U. So Lagrange's equations, of course, are um, d mu of partial L, partial of d phi d mu, of d mu phi is equal to partial L, partial phi. So that's what you get from requiring that the action be stationary. And so this is um, this is b double dot <coughs> minus the space derivative term um, is equal to the phi derivative of this. So this is u prime. Uh, and when I write u prime, I mean the derivative of u with respect to phi. We could write that as u comma p or just d u p. Okay, so in the case in which u is um, um, and over four phi squared minus p squared, which is squared, which is what we were doing here, then this thing is. Um, lambda over 2, p squared minus v squared times 2 phi. So that's, the, that's what u prime is. So the equation is phi double dot minus phi. So partial with, second partial with respect to time minus second partial with respect to space is equal to this thing, which involves v cubed and phi. And the v cubed term then is, makes the thing um, difficult. In, in general, these nonlinear differential equations, partial differential equations, are very hard to solve. But it turns out that in two dimensions, 
you can find special solutions rather easily. And it's a, um, it's a trick that's actually analogous to tricks one uses in mechanics. And so, and, and in particular, the, the, um, the case here is to look at um, solutions that are functions of, um, where phi depends really on one variable. And uh, one way of thinking of that is to let phi of x be phi of k dot x, where k is some four vector. And when you do that, then you've got some new variable, which you can call y. And then this is an, an equation which involves essentially phi double prime. The second derivative with respect to y is equal to, equal to this. And this is still a nonlinear differential equation. But it turns out there's a trick to solve such thing. Anyway, it's equivalent. Equivalently, we can imagine, we can just look for static solutions of this. So now we're looking for solutions minus phi double prime equals that. And um, that's the same thing as saying that we want this to be stationary. So for this to be stationary, what we have is integral dx e prime change in p prime minus u prime change in p. So that's the change in the mass. And um, so we want that to be zero. We just uh, d phi, is, the change in phi prime is the same thing as the spatial derivative of the change in phi. We integrate by parts and we get uh, minus p double prime ta uh, times variation of p minus u prime variation of p. And so we get the equation um, minus p double prime minus u prime equals zero. And um, whoops, it was a plus here. and uh, a plus there. So the equation is P double prime is U prime. And um, so now, so this is still, this is the same differential equations we had up there when we just set the time dependence equal to zero. But now um, we play the trick. The trick is we multiply by five prime. So now, this thing is d dx of phi prime squared um, times one half. And now this is du d phi, d phi dx. So this is d dx of u of phi. So this is u of phi. So d, d, du dx is du d phi times d phi dx. And now this is, a, this is an equation that's very simple because it says this is an extra derivative of the left hand side is equal to the extra derivative of the right hand side. And so we can write 1 half phi prime squared is equal to u of phi uh, plus some constant. So now we've reduced it to a um, a first order differential equation. It's still nonlinear, but this is the sort of thing that calculus allows us to solve. It's p prime squared then is two u plus two c. P prime is square root of two u plus two c. And so now we can write this as d phi over the square root of 2 u of phi plus 2c is equal to dx. And so we just have to do this integral. And um, I was doing one of these integrals last night, or the night before, and um, I pulled up x maple 
and I got some horrible thing involving two logs. I then went to Wolfram Alpha and um, gave me exactly what I wanted. So let's look at the case where u is lambda over 4, p squared minus p squared squared. And um, what I'm, I'm going to now make a choice of the constant that's going to simplify the arithmetic. I want to choose the case where phi prime uh, is equal to 0 when phi is equal to v. And that's sort of what you'd imagine you want. Namely, that uh, obviously when phi finally gets equal to v, it's not changing anymore. Phi, phi prime is not zero only when you're going from, uh, well, when absolute value of phi is equal to v. So when way back here, when it really becomes equal to v, then the derivative, we're saying the derivative asymptotically goes to zero as phi asymptotically goes to minus v or plus v. All right, well that makes the integral simpler. It means on the left-hand side we get x plus some x zero or uh, is equal to an integral d phi. And now we have the square root of, that means, that means that c is equal to zero. Because u is equal to 0, phi prime is equal to 0. So the 2u then is lambda over 2, p squared minus v squared squared. But now you see this is much simpler because the square root of a perfect square, well, this is square root of 2 over lambda integral d phi. That's a d phi, not phi phi over, well, the square root of that is just phi squared minus phi squared. And the integral of this is, um, it turns out it's, um, for some reason, it's a minus sign. Minus root 2 over lambda hyperbolic tangent inverse of phi over v. <coughs> Bless you. Divided by v. All right, so if we rewrite this, what we've got is minus v root lambda over 2, x minus x0. Let's take this again, minus. Is equal to hyperbolic tangent inverse of phi over v. And so now, what we've got, what we've got is the anti-kink. That's why I put C for conjugate. V of x then is V hyperbolic tangent of minus V square root of lambda over 2, x minus x0. So this is something that, uh, this is the anti-kink at, um, as x goes to infinity, this goes to minus infinity. The uh, hyperbolic tangent of minus infinity is um, what's the hyperbolic tangent is e to the x minus e to the minus x over e to the x plus e to the minus x. And, um, X, yeah, as, as, as I'm sorry, as X goes to infinity, this goes to minus infinity, and at minus infinity, this dominates, and this goes to minus one. So this thing goes to minus V as X goes to infinity. So this is the anti king And as X goes to minus infinity, it goes to plus V. And uh, so this thing looks like So this is the anti-kink. Um, the kink, of course, you just change the size. The kink. And, and you can think of this as a kink at x0, because that's where the energy is. 
it's changing from V to minus V at X zero. And the ordinary kink is V, hyperbolic tangent of V root lambda over two X minus X zero. All right. Um, there's another famous soliton, and it's the sine Gordon soliton. And um, I talked a little bit about this a couple of lectures ago. Let me just give you the details for this. In this particular case, u of v is alpha over beta squared, 1 minus cosine beta v. So now, Let's just look at what cosine does. Cosine starts out at 1. And pi over 2 is 0. Then it goes to minus 1. Then in 3 pi over 2, it's 0 again. And in 2 pi, it's back up to 1. So in other words, this thing is 0 when beta phi is equal to 2 pi n for n in some integer. And um, so this is more this is a more amusing theory than the simpler kink theory because now you can have these funny kinks that start at um, phi equal to 2 pi n over beta, some arbitrary, with some arbitrary n, and then go up maybe one unit, go up two units, go down, well, down another unit, and they can go way up several units and so forth. So in other words, they can just arbitrarily flip from one end to another. Um, however, the one that simply goes from uh, let's say 0 to 1. In other words, it goes from 0 to 2 pi over beta. This solution is 5x equal to 4 over beta. Angle whose tangent is, in other words, the arctan of exp of square root of alpha times x. So it actually has a rather funny sort of form. Um, it, um, so and now this one, as x goes to infinity, what happens? This goes to infinity. The angle who's the arctan of infinity is pi over 2. And so this goes to 4 over beta, pi over 2, which is 2 pi over beta. So that's, that's what I said, 2 pi over beta. On the other hand, as x goes to minus infinity, this goes to 0. The arctan of 0 is just 0. And so it's 0 over here. Um, the energy of this, uh, this soliton the mass of the soliton turns out to be 8 square root of alpha over beta squared. Okay, so that's, that's what I wanted to say about the solitons. Um, of course, you can say a lot more about the solitons. Um, so let me, let, me, let me just pause a second. If this is the first time you've seen this, this is a lot of material. Is, do you have some question? Maybe another question?
let me back up. Let, let me, um, let's see. Let me go up in dimension now and do, do what's called um, Let's look at things in two space and one time. Two plus one dimensions. Um, by the way, these, these one dimensional kinks, as I said in class when I first did this uh, talk about sometimes, these, um, in fact, a tsunami is a kink. Okay. Um, so now let's look at uh, two plus one dimensions. And if we're just looking at the mass of a thing, then we're integrating, instead of dx, we're integrating over the two space dimensions. We're, we're considering a time independent. Uh, the solution. So it's d phi star, and I'm going to use a complex field. So this is this is the mass. Now, how? Uh, what has to happen here? Well, at spatial infinity. And of course, there's a lot of spatial infinity because you can go out in any direction. Or just going out is so. What we have to have is that phi has to be something like v e to the i theta, so that this symmetry breaking term is zero. Otherwise, you have uh, infinite energy. And So in other words, what one, another way of looking at that, looking like, another way of looking at this is if you, this is a complex field, if you think of it as two real fields, then it's, um, well, it's V cosine theta sine theta in the, in the sense of two real fields. Um, and now, um, so if we think of it as two real fields, then it looks like this, V x hat, basically. And so, so way out here, it's pointing this way, way out here, it's pointing this way, way out there, it's pointing this way, and then way down there, it's pointing this way. So that means that as you go around the circle once, the total change in phi is basically 2 pi v. And, but on the other hand, the perimeter is 2 pi r. So this is 2 pi r. So basically, this grad phi term, which occurs there, is essentially v over r. So it's V over R. And so we've got a problem here with the kinetic term. We've made this zero, but this kinetic term is an integral. D2x is 2 pi R dr, but this grad phi is V squared over R squared, and that's dr. So altogether it's 2 pi V squared integral dr over R. Now, here it's at um, near the origin, we can say that phi is zero. And we pay a price in the potential term, but it can be zero and then it gradually goes up. Uh, it, 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 in other words, it becomes, becomes V e to the i theta only when you get out to a certain radius here. 
So that means that the infrared singularity we can uh, fix by just having it vanish at zero, and that doesn't cost us infinite energy. The trouble is, when you integrate out to infinity, you have a log divergence. So you can't have this, um, this, this solution, this finite energy uh, vortex, if you want, in this theory. However, what you do is you simply gauge the theory. In other words, replace the covariant, you replace the derivative di phi by di phi, which is di phi minus i e a i, the covariant derivative. And you then choose a so that if phi of x goes to v e to the i theta, say, so that this term is 0 at infinity, then uh, you, you choose a so that the new method, so that in the new theory, the gauge theory, you have d2 x, then you would have uh, D I V star D I V um, plus lambda. Let me just say phi squared phi squared squared. Okay. So now you've got a spatial infinity. This is zero. You also want this to be zero at spatial infinity. And then you have something finite. Okay. So let me. By the way, I have one piece of candy left from my stockpile. So you have you get one more piece of candy if you ask a question. And then I'm out until I go to Costco. Well, it turns out that the AI is in the following form. AI as R goes to infinity minus i over e, 1 over phi squared, phi star, di phi. And the reason why this works is that if phi goes to v e to the i theta, well, let's just see what happens. What happens to ai? And ai here is minus i over e, 1 over v squared. And now this is v e to the minus i theta, di of e to the i theta, v. v is a constant, but theta varies with, with uh, space. And so this is minus i over e, 1 over v squared. There's a v squared there, e to the minus i theta, and this is i, di theta, e to the i theta. And so all together, this is just di theta over e. And so let's look at what this covariant derivative is then. This covariant derivative, di of v, well, this is v i di theta. That's what this is. And then you have minus i e v e to the i theta for phi. And then a i is d i theta over e. And so good. I, this is a d with respect to i. This is not an i. And so in fact, um, this uh, just directly cancels. It's just, in other words, here the e's cancel. You have a v. Oh, it was an e to the i. No, I've got the. I left out an e to the i theta. So this is. This is just zero. All right. 
So we cured the problem, and now the uh, now we what we've got then in this gauge theory is that um, once again, uh, if if th this isn't well defined at at uh, when r is zero, because um, theta at r equals zero isn't defined. So in other words, what we're going to do then is have this thing be essentially zero here, and then it becomes, phi becomes v e to the i theta. So it goes from zero to v e to the i theta gradually, but relatively quickly. And then, uh, because of the gauge field, the energy out here is zero. Or, but of course, this theory now, it's a gauge theory, and I've left out the energy of the gauge field. And the energy of the gauge field, of course, is um, an integral of b squared over 2, because, in fact, it's a time-independent electromagnetic field. And so what we've got is b squared over 2. So what is um, what is well? Let's figure out what what the what the flux is. What is the flux here? Well, the flux is the integral b over space b dot dA, say b dot ds. So ds is a vector coming out, basically. So the integral b dot ds, well, of course, that's the curl of a dot ds. And so this is the integral of a dot d, um, dx going around. Okay. And so what's a? Well, a is di theta over e. So this is 1 over e integral di theta times dx, which is, I'm getting, all right, so this is, so it's, grad, it's basically grad theta dot dx, okay? And integrated around, and so that just gives you the total change in theta, which is 2 pi over e. And so the flux then is 2 pi over e. And it, so this is a magnetic vortex. Um, it has magnetic field coming out, and um, the energy is basically clustered there. And um, well, it, it actually it's, it's yeah, I guess it is clustered there because if you integrate anywhere around here, you get the same you miss anything, you know, as amount of flux. Yeah, the energy is actually b squared over two. So it's so to figure out what the mass is, you have to you have to be a little more careful. Um, in any event, this, these things actually seem to occur in uh, type two superconductors, and uh, the condensed matter people write the elementary unit of flux here instead of writing it as two pi over e. They write this as, well, we can put in 2 pi, we can put in h bar c over e, but 2 pi h bar is just Planck's constant. So this elementary unit of flux is a simple combination of three different fundamental constants. Um, 
It's also possible that objects like this exist in cosmology, in the big examples of this exist in what are called cosmic strings. Um, we had a colloquium on that he's, but I frankly forget. Well, I, I, I think that the, I think that, well, I'm certain there's no evidence for them, but uh, they may be out there soon. So any questions to get the last piece of candy? All right, now, let's go back and look at the kink. One of these kinks is, for example, the simple kink over there. In um, spatial infinity is two points. And it maps the two points into um, minus v and v which are also effectively two points. Um, in the case of, so that was the kink. In the case of this vortex, what we have is spatial infinity. And in spatial infinity, the field has to be V e to the i theta, which is, also, which is a circle. So spatial infinity is effectively a circle. And so the field maps spatial infinity into, maps a circle, the circle of spatial infinity into the circle V e the i theta. And, well, mathematicians have a name for these things. Pi n of m is the homotopy group. Top, really know how to pronounce it. Um, of maps from the sphere Sn into the manifold M. And what we can see pretty clearly in this case is that you can have phi sub n of R theta be just be just I mean at spatial infinity as R goes to infinity, this can be simply V e to the i n theta. So the set of maps, you have one map, one map basically for each integer. And the, the, the idea here, I should say something about what we're, what we're saying here is that you've got a map from this circle into this circle, and the idea is the map is continuous, and if the map goes around once, so if this is the map that goes, so we'll say we're at n equals one, then you can't continuously change that map into a map that goes around twice or goes around only zero times, or goes around minus one times by going backwards. Okay. They're all they're they're um in other words, you can make a you can make a small change in this map, in that it could go, it could go like this. It could go forward a little bit, then it could go back a little bit, then it could go forward, and you go back a little bit, then go around. Okay, that map is you can is deformable continuously into one that simply goes around. But you can't continuously deform a map that um, goes around once into one that goes around twice. Anything else. And so this group, um, the maps from the circle to the circle, it's then pi 1 of the circle, which is S1. This turns out to be Z, the group of the integers. And the, uh, there's the integer, N. And um, so that's what we've seen here in the case of the, of the vortex. Um, in, um, it turns out that for n greater than or equal to 1, there's a 
simple as a result, I should call it simple because I don't remember how complicated the proof is, but pi n of Sn, so these are maps from the n sphere to the n sphere. Turns out that's also the integers. And this kink, which this thing here, this mathematicians call this S0, and this also S0. So this is pi 0 of S0. And we've seen that that's Z2. In other words, it's go up or you go down. All right, so that's that. All right, now, now let me go back to magnetic monopoles. And um, so we were in 1 plus 1, 2 plus 1. Now we're going to 3 plus 1 dimensions. And it was at Hoff who first worked this out. And um, I remember his his preprint, um, he was at CERN at the time, and what he did was he was considering, well, let me, let me just start with mass again. Now we're talking about three space dimensions. And let's think about three real fields. So grad phi A squared. Lambda phi a squared minus b squared squared. So it's the same business again. This uh, phi, you can think of it as a three vector, so this is phi dot phi. And once again, um, in order to have, let's think about phi a as being essentially v x a over r as r goes to infinity. Well, once again, you're going to have a divergent term here. And, and so the way you get around this is you say, well, this is going to be a gauge theory. And so you replace grad phi by a covariant derivative, or let me just say di phi goes to big D i. Phi a, which is e i phi a plus e epsilon a b c a b i phi c. And so now, by doing this, one um, we've gone to a theory here that's now d i phi a squared summed over i and a. And now, by choosing a suitable A, we can make this small, just as we did for the vortex. But um, we then have to pay for the magnetic, magnetic energy of this time-independent gauge field. It turns out you can figure out that the A that makes this small is a, a B I goes to 1 over E epsilon b i j x j over r squared. And um, what Hoff did, it turns out, in this um, paper, which was back in about 1976, he um, considered various gauge fields and various, this is, we call this the Higgs field, various gauge fields and various Higgs fields that would minimize this plus the one half b squared term. And what he did was he put in various parameters and minimized the thing on a computer and came out with a mass for this object. And what he also showed was that this was effectively a magnetic monopole. And what what I, the reason why I repeat this is that 
it, you see, if you, if you write down the differential equations for this, they're partial differential equations in four dimensional space time, nonlinear, and they involve these three gauge fields and these three Higgs fields. So it's really uh, very complicated. And um, so what he did was actually do a, did a he wrote a portrait and program or C program or something. Worked it out at that point, which is pretty interesting that that was the sort of approach he took. Anyway, but he he went beyond that and he said, well, let's um, let's define an analog of f mu nu. In other words, let's imagine that, um, I mean, this is the way things are at spatial infinity. And so, in fact, if you look at this, you've got three gauge fields here. Okay? You look at the um, Higgs field at spatial infinity, it's lying on the surface of the sphere. And so it can go in two directions. Two directions are massless, one is massive. The two directions that are massless get absorbed by two of these gauge fields which become massive in just the Anderson-Higgs mechanism. And um, so one field is left over that's massless. But because of this peculiar mixture, notice that the B is mixed, this is a flavor index or a, an internal index, which goes from one to three, but I, J, which also go from one to three, are spatial indices. And so you've got this thing that mixes space and internal symmetry indices. Anyway, so the idea is that the combination, it turns out that the combination of gauge fields that remains massless in, um, in any particular direction depends on the direction. And in fact, um, this is the electromagnetic field. So it's the ordinary, it's the Yang Mills F mu nu times phi A over phi minus epsilon ABC. Epsilon ABC is, you know, the thing that's totally anti-symmetric. Uh, if ABC are 1, 2, 3, it's 1. Phi A D mu phi B D nu phi C over E phi Q. So that's what he identified as the electromagnetic field. And it turns out that you can show, we're basically out of time, but let me just show you what the answer is. Remember I have these, this inequality here? If you apply that to this, to this theory with this term, this term, and then b squared over 2, what you find is this is greater than or equal to 4 pi v times g, or absolute value of g, where g is the magnetic charge of the monopole. So that's basically that. Um, all right, I think we'll make a little do you, do you have any questions? Don't want the last piece of candy. All right, so why don't you turn it off?